Ladies and gentlemen, the man Jimmy Doolittle called the greatest stick and rudder pilot in the world. The man Chuck Yeager said was the best pilot I ever saw, R.A. Bob Hoover. about the last thing I do remember. But Bob, you were there in my head and in my heart telling me the right thing to do as you have for many other aviators throughout your long career. Kent Walker Ewing, uh, who's here tonight, call sign Eagle, uh, former commanding officer of USS America in Desert Storm and his son Taylor were en route to Birmingham from Norfolk for a family reunion when they're uh, about 25 miles from his destination. Uh, the engine in Kent's airplane, his Bonanza, uh, crapped out on him and they were at 6,500 feet. Oil on the windscreen, smoke in the cockpit. They were going to land, but it wasn't going to be at an airport. And Kent says he heard Bob's voice in his ear saying, fly the airplane as far as you can into the crash. They touched down in, in a field, rolled down the hill, scrubbed off a wing against a tree. That's another one of your pieces of advice. <laughs> Scrub off the energy if you can with a non-critical part of the airplane. Uh, they missed animals in the barn and... Uh, on, a, on the oil and the, and the pressure got me and the engine stopped. And I got about 2,000 feet from the time I noticed the drives on, in temperature. And I uh, took advantage of that and, took, and changed my airspeed to altitude, so I came to the 1,000 feet or 2,000, or whatever it might have been, uh, from doing my aerobatic routine. And uh, Ray was in the back seat with a camera. And I said, Ray, you take over the radio and, and declare our May Day. I'm going to be pretty busy. <laughs> and here's what I did. And I, I hope you learn something from this. When the engine would quit, I had no way of getting uh, in my oil pressure, but I could keep the engine or get it started again, so I, I pushed the primer and gave it a squirt of fuel that couldn't go to the engine otherwise once it had quit. And the engine would start and it would spin up to full RPM and I'd see the temperature going overboard and uh, the engine would quit. And so I kept milking the mouse, if you will, <laughs> to get it back to the the, I was hoping for, for Long Beach, but they had a little strip there on the coast and uh, it's only 2,000 feet long, but it was loaded with cars when I could see it from a distance. And I, 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 I told uh, Ray that I was going to go back and try and make it into the Torrance Airport. And so I kept doing this until I got a burp every now and then, another thousand feet. And I got it with a populated area, and I felt pretty good about everything. And we were about uh, 30 or 40 feet on the final approach to the numbers. And uh, we could see the fire truck waiting, waiting for us. Ray had gotten in contact with everybody while I was busy fiddling around in the cockpit. and. Uh, I said, looks like we got it made. And I could see the numbers. And, and all of a sudden, there was a terrible explosion. And uh, neither one of us ever heard anything quite that, that lasting. And all of a sudden, the, the prop stopped, and the engine twisted in the mouth and was hanging down like this, but still attached. One wing, believe it or not, was compressed instead of looking like a wing with a top and a bottom, it was flattened out. 
and the other wing was blown up like so. And I turned off right at the first taxiway. The fire trucks were waiting there, and the fire that, that had come with the explosion, just no, no wind, and it was going straight up. Fire went out, and I said, don't use the hose on it. And so we didn't. The airplane was, was a total mess, and uh, never flew again, of course. But Ray Hughes had the courage to sit there and ride through this whole event. But the trick was, think out of the box. When you have an emergency, it's great to be religious and, and, and say a prayer and say, please help me. Please help me, dear God. But before he can answer, you're dead. <laughs> I've got to tell you, I've been where this dear friend of mine right here was. And I'm looking at it and I think I've got about 10 seconds left before I'm going in. And I thought, well, it's going to be over with real quick. <laughs> but I'm going to fly the, the Berman thing until it hits the ground. And I did. Thank goodness he did. And it has saved many lives. And if, if that, uh, little thing I've just said about, it can help you too. But there are lots of little things that most people never think about. But in the kind of flying I've done, it's not because I was any better than anybody else, it was because I had assignments that gave me high-risk programs and uh, made me think out of the box and uh, what would I do if. And so I've always had a little backup up here what I'm going to do if this happens or that happens. And uh, I think each and every pilot that flies ought to think about those kind of things. I I'm going to change subjects on here for a minute. Has anybody announced about Neil Armstrong's two sons who are here tonight? No. <laughs> if I, Mark, could I get you and your brother to come up here for a minute? Or at least Jerry Lips, in front of all of you. Jerry Lips, you and your family have done so much for aviation. When you put out that, uh, that information that we had so often about the future things that could happen, and you kept our mind and, and thoughts thinking ahead of where are we going from here with this aviation and aerospace uh, industry and what can we do to assist it to happen? Well, the Jerry Lips family have made us all aware of the importance of this evening that we're having here tonight. And I want to thank that family for all they, they've done to make this a uh, Mark, take, take the mic and introduce your brother. <laughs> so, so Bob, that's Mark. I'm Rick. Thank you, Bob. I know Dad had great admiration for Bob. Because although he did a lot of things, Dad, that means, did a lot of things that he never came back and told us about. Every time he'd been with Bob, he came back and, and made sure to let us know that they'd had a great talk, great stories. Yeah. <laughs> Dad, you know, had a reputation of not saying very much. He, <laughs> Whoever gave him this reputation 
never asked him any questions about airplanes. <laughs> because if they had, they would have gotten hours of discussion. And I have a feeling that there's a lot of people in this room that do the there same thing. There are so thing. many of us in this room and around the world that would not be alive today unless you have taken us under your way. Through your mentorship and guidance, you've instilled in us a passion and reverence for the art form called flight. But also, and more importantly, you instilled in us a passion and reverence for the art form called life. You taught us to be a true leader. You needed to have an iron will to always do the right thing, no matter what the consequences. You taught us you're only re relevant when you're given back. Through your grace and dignity, Bob, you've inspired in us to strive to be better human beings, a better patriot, to always work to make this country a better place. For those reasons, Bob, we thank you. For those reasons, Bob, we cherish you. And for those reasons, Bob, we love you. God bless America, and God <laughs> bless R.A. Bob Hoover. Thank you for your